It's such a joy to be here. You know, uh, yesterday I was traveling up and the journey on the train took longer than I expected. So I thought I'd try out the technology. <laughs> and I never expected it to work on a four-hour, two, it was a two-carriage train taking four hours from one corner of the earth to the other. Uh, in rural areas, and I put my mobile phone up, propped it by the window, I opened my computer, and there I was, in worship. It's absolutely amazing. And I, I worked my way through the morning session, the afternoon session, and then sat through the whole of the celebration in the evening. Isn't that, it was just, it was, I was really struggling to keep quiet, it was my silent carriage, and I wanted to join in. <laughs> what a fantastic worship band we have, can we just give them a round of applause, they're just such a fantastic blessing and encouragement, uh, you know, uh, just a sense of the presence of God which was infectious and reached across the earth. And I can tell you that there's lots of people watching at the moment. I looked last night, you know, and many uh, of the sessions that uh, I'm seeing happening like this uh, around the world, uh, you find there's an audience, a, a congregation, a meeting, a forum, but we're reaching two or three times as many actually outside live. It happened the other night, I was in Glasgow um, at a church, we had about 400 in, and I counted, I think there were 2,000 out, wow. all the way around the world. Only the Lord knows who they are, or where they come from, or, or what their stories are, but we are in a changing world, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about a reality check about the future of mission. And you know, I want to recap, we heard yesterday afternoon about being called to be fishers of men and women and going wherever God leads, as uh, Chris was challenged us last night. And the why, that they all may find eternal life. And I've been thinking a lot about this journey of life. The fact is that the whole of the Christian faith will die out in a single generation. Hello? You know, I've been thinking about that. We are, we are grandparents now. We have uh, four grandchildren. And I think about this generation. If we do not transmit faith from the generation that is my age and above to the generation that are children today, that faith will be gone from the face of this earth within a generation. It's a huge responsibility, this transmission of life. And I want to look at the truth about mission. Because there are so many things being said about mission, which quite frankly are start raving bonkers. Okay, so here we go. My job is to advise very large companies on the future. It's a strange story. It began about 20 years ago out of writing books. It was church planting, I then started the AIDS charity asset, and we continued to write as, as I felt God teach me and told me to write about uh, trying to write a book a year about things. Um, you know what? We can prophesy to the walls of the ghetto, but I'm tired of prophesying to the walls of the ghetto when our world needs to hear about God's purpose and design for living. And so these books have been largely written for outside the church, uh, for people who don't know faith, they don't know God, but they share our values and are curious about what Christians might think. Um, and you know what? Almost everything that is to do with change is happening on the outer edge of that radar screen. And you know what? There are two words which are the greatest risk for every leader. Two words are the greatest risk for every leader. And it doesn't matter whether you're a big multinational or uh, the Archbishop of Academy or the leader of your church, and they are institutional blindness. It's when we've been in one community for a long time See, when, when we had the subprime crisis, it was because a whole load of banks had spent too much time listening to too many other banks, and they all walked over the same cliff together. The scariest audience I've ever had was the Pentagon, lecturing to 500 generals and admirals about ways to in reduce international tension using cruise missiles. <laughs> that was a scary assignment. What was even scarier... I was when I was taken on one side just 10 minutes before going into the room. And they said, we're locked down in secret session at the moment, which is why you can't go in there. But I can't do the American accent, I'm afraid. Uh, but soon you'll be in there. But there's one thing you need to know, Dr. Nixon. You're the first non-US citizen ever to have addressed this assembly. <laughs> Does that worry you? I'll tell you, it really worried me. Now, I'm not knocking Americans. It would be the same in the Ministry of Defense. When you have too many war game generals in the same country playing war games with each other, you get a miscalculation. And you get a North Korean 
a miscalculation or a, um, you get a, a, a chimera miscalculation. So we live in dangerous times. And the greatest risk for the Pentagon is institutional blindness. The greatest risk for President Trump is institutional blindness. The greatest risk for Theresa May is institutional blindness. So let's try and take off our glasses and let's have a big explore of the world. And one, here, here are a few reality checks. As I've gone around the world looking to corporates, and, and, and uh, I, I often show this slide right at the beginning, and it might be a thousand people in an auditorium like this on the future of marketing, the future of mobile, the future of banking, the future of energy, but I throw out a slide um, like, like this, and I say this, life's too short to waste on things you don't believe in. Put up your hands if you think that's true. And you know what? They thunder and they clap. I did that with four and a half thousand people in Las Vegas. Very few of them were believers, but they all loved the value. Life's too short to waste a single hour on things you think are crap. <laughs> Isn't that right? See, I, my, my background, I'm a physician by background. I specialized in the care of people dying of cancer. And I learned that life really is short. And every day it really counts. Life's too short to follow someone you don't believe in. Put up your hands if you think that's true. Now, life's too short to deliver a strategy you think is nonsense inside a company. When one uh, person saw that slide, actually, let's keep the slides up all the time if you can. If you kill the video, that would be great. Um, <laughs> if we go back. Life's too, when it, the chairman, the, the CEO of one of the largest private banks of the world, she saw that slide, she resigned from her job immediately. Why? Because she realized she did not believe in what she was selling. She was selling the things with the best commission for the bank, but they weren't necessarily right for the customer. She said, I couldn't live with my conscience anymore. I resigned. I'm out. I'm saying this to encourage you. I want to give you a reality check about the future of mission because it's different from what you're reading in the press. It's different from what you're seeing on social media. And I want to tell you the truth. Here is the truth. Wherever I go in the world, people are looking for purpose. And I say hallelujah, because we have it. Their ultimate destiny is what people are looking for. Brexit, we can debate about Brexit, we can debate about Trump. You know, life's too short to follow people you don't believe in. That is why Mr. Trump got elected. That is why Brexit happened. That is why we're seeing strange elections around the face of this earth, because in this country, for the last 20 years, I wrote a book called The Truth About Westminster in 1995. At that time, in 1995, I said this, 90% of this country do not trust a single word that politicians say. Survey show that. The only groups as distrusted as politicians in this country are... Actually not. Actually, journalists. So, poor old Trump, he's got a point. When he says fake news, actually he already has 90% of America half thinking he's right. And in this country it's the same. So when you have a profound mistrust of leadership and a profound mistrust of any fact you read in the media, you get a very toxic combination. You see, it's all about the biggest single word which is driving the future. What is that? It's not only trust. The biggest single word which drives the future is emotion. It's the passions that we have. It's the emotional reactions to events which change human history rather than the events itself. You can see this over and over and over again. It's the same in the markets. It's the same with house prices. It's the same with just about everything. Let's go back to the slides. We can keep them up. Thank you. The future is about emotion. Here is a truth, another reality check. So the web, web is making us very impatient, and that's affecting Christian mission. So we're in an uber society, a society where two billion people are now on Facebook. We are treating our social life in digits of three or four seconds at a time. One third of new relationships in America are now started online. Bang, bang. One third. Now, don't despise them. Actually, online, I think, is not a bad way to meet someone for the first time. If they're a network of a network of a network of a friend of a very close friend or a colleague, why not? You might think that's very radical. I don't think it's radical at all. And by the way, I've got nothing against Christian dating platforms. After all, Abraham had tried to sort something out for Isaac, did he not? <laughs> I think we got far too squeamish about some of these things. And I think there's a whole load of people um, who, uh, who we, do, we need to release pressures of. 
um, and just find different ways and patterns of meeting people and associating. But here is this. While the reality check is, yes, while those are happening, some other things are happening as well. Now, the web is making us very impatient. So imagine last night, you check into your room, you're doing FaceTime with the kids, you're watching TV, you're eating a hamburger, you're doing your email, and you're on the iPad. For some very strange reason, you wanted to check Britney Spears' birth date. Now, I don't know why, but you did. Okay. <laughs> So you typed in Britney Spears' birthday, you press return, and here's the key. You waited. Dum -da -da, dum -da -da. How long will you wait for Britney Spears' birthday to appear in Google before you press the back button? Put up your hands. If life is too short to wait for Britney Spears after five seconds, you press the back button, you have terminated it. See, after two seconds, you were irritated. After three seconds, you blamed the people video streaming in the room next door. <laughs> after four seconds, you thought the web was completely bust. After five seconds, you lost the will to live, and you were out. <laughs> now, okay. So Elim church leaders lose the will to live in an average of 5.3 seconds. Okay. <laughs> Put up your hands. If you get it frustrated, how long it takes the counting machine to count the cash out of the ATM once you put in your PIN number. Put your... Put up your hands if you find it monumentally irritating how wet you get in the snow and the sleet when you're trying to fill your car with diesel. <laughs> you see, we are becoming very impatient. Here's another example of it. Uh, so uh, my wife has been trying to get money back from the electricity company. They owe us a shed load of cash, so she phones them up. Press one for accounts, press two for customer service, ding dong, ding dong. Put up your hands if you think that is a theft of your time. The people who put in such systems should be put in prison for a very long time. <laughs> Yet the strange thing is that most large corporations love such systems. It's crazy. You see, we have this schizophrenic attitude. People go to work, they kiss their other brain goodbye, and then in the coffee break, they lose the will to live over five seconds. I'm just saying these things affect mission. They affect us. Yes, we talked yesterday about what it means for preaching in a world where people have attention span of five seconds. It means we have to be very visual. Actually, it means experimenting, things like maybe it's blocking out, so maybe one or two or three people sometimes addressing the same topic in 10 or 15 minute sections or whatever it is. Yes, attention span is changing. But before we, before we overreact to some of this, I just want to look at some other truths which, are, which balance this. For a start, this freneticism in terms of Time and pace is producing a hunger for inner peace, tranquility, stress-free life, and just a deep breath. And this plays right into the very heart of everything that we are. Jesus Christ, yesterday, the day, today, and forever. Uh, the great eternity, uh, the, the God who is outside of time. Now, while many things are changing, here is a truth, reality check. Many huge trends are changing much more slowly than most people in your church think. Much more slowly than Google thinks, Microsoft thinks, General Electric thinks, Airbus thinks. What are these truths? These are really important for you. Because I'm seeing all kinds of experiments being done in church life that actually we need to just take a deep breath and think. And let me give you an example. I want you to imagine a really good friend of yours uh, 18 or 19 years ago, had a huge car accident and was taken to a local hospital here and has been unconscious for all that time. And he's woken up about a month ago. And he asked for you by name, and here's the guy called Jerry, and he asked for Jerry by name and says, Jerry, I've lost, apparently, 18 years of my life. I don't even remember the accident, actually. I, 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 what have I missed? What's happened to the Elin movement? What's happened to evangelism and church and mission? Um, have I missed a world war? I mean, what happened to mobile phones? And, and what, what, what's happened to life and fashions and music? I just feel so vulnerable. And how long do you think it would take you to bring him up to date? Now, I wrote a whole chapter on this issue in the book. How long do you think it would take you to bring him so up to date that he could slip into this conference here, he'd look completely fashionable, he'd feel completely uh, at one with what's happening and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't embarrass himself in any conversation? You would not guess. I think less than two hours. See, so little has changed in the world. I shouldn't say that. See, I'm a futurist. I get paid a huge amount of money to scare huge corporations to death and then charge them millions of dollars to sort themselves out. <laughs> I'm just, can you turn the camera off? See, it's a secret. It's my professional secret. 
See, I just wrote another book on the future. It's called The Future of Almost Everything. There's some copies downstairs. You can check it out. See, I, I found my publisher said I've got a problem. I've just read the book I wrote in 1998. I think it was pretty good. Can I copy and paste just, you know? So I did. <laughs> if you don't believe me, go on the website, have a look. Now, don't do it now. Do it later. You'll see it's true. I've even used the same chapter headings, six chapter headings. The chip chapter said chip six chapter headings are exactly the same as they were in 1998. Why? Because I can't find anything much that's changed. I've been predicting the future for corporations for 20 years. I've been describing huge trends for 30 years. Yes, something's changed, but not as much as you think. Let me give you some examples to prove it. Okay, now I'm exaggerating a little bit, but just to make us think. But I really have cut and pasted the whole load of sections over. I really did. Because what was true, the fundamental drivers of mission, of corporate success, of transformation in our world remain exactly, almost exactly as they were 20 years ago. So I'd say take heart before you think, oh, I'm so punch drunk every time I turn the telly on, I feel sick with all these things that are happening. <laughs> okay, here is the truth. Okay, let's take robots. Robots are supposed to be destroying the world and taking away all our jobs. Do you know the growth of robots is only 7% per year? Nothing compared to apps or mobile data, the internet of things, the cloud, things like that. Okay, here's another one. Okay, so robots are 3D printing. Anybody got a 3D printer? Are you enjoying it? Very little. Surprise, surprise. I am bored rigid of printing toys on a plastic 3D printer at home. There is more to life than 3D printers, my friends, and they are not the panacea. They're not going to change the whole world. I'm quite interested in printing organs for people as a physician. That's cool. See, I'm just saying, think, here's another example. Okay, 3D headsets. Put your hands up if you've got a 3D virtual reality, augmented reality headset, so you can go to Mallorca in your living room. <laughs> One, give them a round of applause, folks. You seeing the future. Do you know, 3D TVs have been such a flop, that uh, curved screen 3Ds, that every single manufacturer on the earth has just cancelled the lot. They've thrown them in the skip. They can't think what to do with, 3D, with curved TVs, because, no, no, the curved TVs, yes, but the 3D TVs, no. Curved TVs, yes, they're selling them. 3D TVs with a headset, complete waste of time. I'm just saying, let's in reality. Here's some other examples. The amount of cash in your pockets today is exactly the same as it was last year, despite the growth of global payments, which is confusing many banks. Our friend has just woken up. He turns up to the Elim conference in his 22-year-old suit and tie and, and trousers and his 21-year-old his, his shoes because it's all he had to wear. He says, that I'm completely fashionable. In fact, he says, looking at what the women are wearing, it's exactly as it was. I turn on the music on the way here, I recognize 75% of the songs, and actually 85% of the worship songs we sang here sort of sounded vaguely familiar. And I, and I didn't recognize them precisely, but they were generally in style, they were fundamentally the same. In fact, the format of the conference is more or less as it was. Um, let's carry on. Oh, Holmes, I went to my daughter's home, he said. She's had two different kitchen kit-outs in the last 20 years, but it looks identical. <laughs> I can use every device. I cooked a meal without a single button expedition. I walked into my new car. My wife has bought a new car. She says it's, bit, it's a bit electric. I don't know what that means, but it still works. The buttons and the, everything is exactly as it was, but we had a bigger sat-nav on the left-hand side. How cool is that? 20 years of change. I could carry on music, um, uh, and let's have a look at classrooms. So I teach at London Business School. Uh, in February, I lectured to 400 deans of business schools across the world about the future of business education, virtual classrooms, and the need to transform with digital tools how we communicate all the stuff we talk about in church, right? Except I didn't. Why is that? Because actually, the tools that are really working in business schools still are classroom, breathing the same air, making disciples. Actually, we call it mentoring or coaching. <laughs> it's all face-to-face -face stuff. And you know what we're using? 
flip charts, pieces of paper, and pens. Now, it's not because business schools are out of date. It's because they are actually also understanding the future. I'm just saying, be careful. So uh, let's carry on with this list. Um, books. Did you know that, did, uh, uh, that children book sales in the UK went up 17% last year? Physical book sales have soared and Kindle sales have slumped. Okay, carry on. Um, festivals. Oh my goodness, we are certainly in boom time in festivals. People love to be together. The larger the better and the more fresh air there is and the muddier it is, the happier people are. That's in the secular world, it's so in the church. Um, people love to be together for huge events. Corporate events have never been so popular around the world. That's my job. It's, well, thank God they're still carrying on. Otherwise I'd be unemployed. People gather. They gather at things like this. They gather in forums of 10, 12, 15, 100, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 50,000 people. Whenever President Trump wants to have a good time, he books a book football stadium. Why is that? Because people love to gather. They love to gather. They love to worship too. They love to worship. And the more people in the room, the better. Why is that? Because you can have a bigger band. Because there's a fantastic atmosphere. Because you can forget about anybody looking at you in a crowd of 500 and just be swept up in a great sense of the overwhelming presence and grace and the favor of God. Isn't that amazing? And we're praying for others. That hasn't changed. Home groups, the, the essential importance of hospitality in the home as a method of discipleship, pastoring, and evangelism. It's a biblical command. It will later be set in concrete for humanity for the next 10,000 years or if the Lord comes before that. But every single day we're commanded to be hospitable. Where does that mean? It means in our homes, correct? Therefore, we have home-based ministry commanded by Scripture, absolutely timeless. And I tell you, there's not a single thing that's changed in that. Alpha is just as relevant as it was 20 years ago. Put up your hands if you think, I think that's true. Yes, it can be tweaked and something. I'm just saying, please, take heart, my friends. Let's focus on some things that are changing dramatically. Yes, they, I will come to them, but also recognize that a huge number of things are not. Yes, it was fantastic to be on the train and be swept up in worship. But, oh, my word, this morning, how more heavenly to be here. You know, uh, corporations know that. They know that. Uh, they, they know that corporations know. They've been predicting. Some have been predicting the death of corporate travel with the rise of Skype and video. You know what? Corporations know that to do a deal, you have to eat. Did you know that? You can't, eat, you can't do a deal without eating, especially in emerging markets where all the big deals are being done. And if you're in Russia, you have to drink vodka as well. But that's all right. <laughs> Praise Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and, you know, at the center of it all is still what it has been for 2,000 years which is the encounters of Jesus with individuals usually come on a one-on basis through friendship, family, relationship, working colleagues, observing our lives. These three wonderful friends of mine, Ravi Dewar on my left, uh, spectacularly converted. Jesus appears to him in a dream in the night about 22 years ago, spectacularly converted from a Hindu background, but has had Christian influence, married to a Christian, lots of Christian friends around, and then this amazing thing happened. Um, in the middle, we have a Nisham as a member of our team in another country in Asia and uh, spectacularly converted from a Muslim background. He's been a Christian for two years. His brothers have become a Christian, other members of his family. He tells me that there are 12 of them in their church. They meet in the front on a group of their own. They meet during the week. They're seeing many others finding faith or really interested from the same background. And again, um, members of his family witnessing to him, faithful friends alongside. And then comes the spectacular change on my right um, with Pras, who's uh, converted from a, um, a Buddhist background, less spectacular journey, but again, for friendship, relationship, these things are eternal truths, and we, we lose them at our peril. 85% uh, of all humanity will be living in emerging markets in 10 years' time. In fact, probably already is the case. That means that 85% of God's heart, because uh, our, the heart of our Heavenly Father is equal to all people, is he not? That means 85, when the, our Lord holds the globe of the world in his hands, as I, I hold a globe in our home often, uh, I think it's an amazing thing to do, just hold a globe in your hand, just to hold the whole world in your hand. It's a prophetic thing. When our Heavenly Father holds the whole world in his hand, 
85% of all the people he's looking at are in emerging markets. <laughs> There's hardly anybody living in Europe anymore, have you noticed? We think we're the center of the world. By the way, only 1% of the wealth, 1% of the wealth is owned by, sorry, 50% of the world, world's wealth is owned by just one person in 100. And the extremes are even greater in emerging markets. It's one of the greatest moral stains on our world at the moment. In the next 20 years, I think that will rise to 65% of all the world's wealth owned by 1%. I don't know any human society which has resisted revolution over the last 2,000 years when you get up to those kind of things. So we have destabilizing things which are going on. All is not well in our world. Um, and one billion people are on the move in the next 30 years. How do I know that? Same way as you predict all these other big trends. You look back the last 30 years, right? These are huge forces. They've been going on for a very long time. If you've traveled in rural Africa recently, as I have, you'll find what I've found too, which is lots of young people have moved. They've hopped on the bus or on the back of a lorry. They've gone to town. And when they've gone to town, they send money back. And then they move from the town to the city, and then from a poor city to a wealthier city, and eventually they move from one border to another, maybe. That's why 40% you know, of the whole economy of Kenya is traded on mobile phones. Did you know that? 40% using one platform, and pesa Why is that? Because sending money home. That's been the main reason. Sending money home, sending money home when you migrate. Migration has been one of the biggest drivers of the growth of financial services using mobile phones. Migration is really important. It hugely impacts the church. Migration, here's another reality check. Migration affects HIV. You may not hear about HIV in the media much these days, but HIV, uh, in the year that Ebola was running, HIV killed, I think, 200 times more people than Ebola in that single year. Uh, we don't hear much about it, but it's absolutely still here. It's huge, 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 especially in Africa. But yet we're finding ways to treat it. Thank God for that. And people can live with it for a longer time. Here's another reality check. Can you name a single country at war with another country in the world today? People tell me the world's at war. So many conflicts, deaths and destruction, and military and armies and stuff. I say, okay, can you name me any countries at war with any other countries? I can't. The only two countries at war with each other are North and South Korea, but they're not fighting. They're just talking. They've been talking for 30 years. Yes, we can talk about Syria. We can talk about ethnic genocide and challenges when tribes fight tribes inside the same country, which is a terrible tragedy, a painful situation. But it's not international war. I don't know about you, but I've been praying for peace in the world since I was a believer. Put up your hands if you pray for peace in the world in the last year. Well, you know what? The Lord may have answered our prayers without us noticing. You see, we're fed this diet on the, in the media, which is not the truth. The truth is not that people are being blown up every day with terrorist bombs. The truth is not that everyone's joined ISIS. Did you know that the statistical risk based on the last eight years of being blown up by a terrorist bomb and killed in the UK is, I think, one in 20 million per year? One in 20 million, my friends, that's less than the chance of being struck by lightning. Yet people start cancelling trips to London. Or I remember some Americans said, are you migrating from London to Birmingham now? I said, why? What's so dangerous in London? <laughs> in Paris. A friend of mine from Australia has cancelled his trip to Istanbul. He said, it's far too dangerous, I'm really scared. My wife and I have been going out of Turkey continuously for the last year and a half, two years. We need a reality check when it comes to risk why? Because the media and this kind of system plays on fear. You see, all you've got to do is have some person with mental health issues probably borrow a knife from his own kitchen and go around and stab a couple of people and say, oh, I did it for ISIS. Then ISIS claims it as another victory. And how many pages of free publicity does that particular cause get? It is absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of free publicity, wall-to-wall -wall coverage, because of some person with mental health problems with one knife. I said, we need a reality check. This is not real. This is just a phantasm. It is not actually what is daily life for most people. And you can go into a place which... I mean, we know this from the IRA attacks here in London, uh, in London and, the, and across the UK, don't we? We lived with them. People outside thought we were bonkers. They didn't know how we even went to the market without fear of getting blown up. So come on, get a life. Do you know there were so many IRA attacks at one point that we stopped evacuating London stations. Do you remember that day? It was a very important one. We decided to shake down. We decided that the truth was, if you want to blow us up, that's fine. The reason is you evacuate people and they blow a bigger bomb immediately outside. 
So we stopped. Just as well. We just decided to carry on. The old wartime spirit, just carry on. Face them down and knock them off the front page of the papers. So I'm just saying we need to rethink what's going on. Don't, and, and here's another reality check. Fantastic reality check. 2.4 billion people are Christians today. Isn't that amazing? 2.4 billion people. 2.4 billion people. Here's, here's another reality check. In the last 15 years, the African church has grown by 51% across the entire African continent. At the same time, 33,000 more Christians every single day in Africa. We've seen gigantic growth in India. I can't even quantify it. Millions of people becoming Christians, especially in the north. I've just come back from Hyderabad. One single church has grown in seven years from nothing to I think it's 34,000 people. Uh, all over the world, these things are happening. China has more believers than any other nation on earth. This is the beginning, my friends. If you want to know the future of mission, open our eyes, stop listening to the crap on the media, and get with the picture. The fact is, 2.3, whatever it was, and if we look at the Islamic community, yes, it's smaller, 1.6 billion, and most of them live a very long way away. 60% of all those that follow the way of Islam live in Asia. They don't live in Europe. There's very little traction of the Islamic community in Europe. Actually, there's a problem. The Islamic community has a problem. Can you imagine for us, imagine that some strange psychotic group from had got hold of an alpha program They're nothing to do with HTB or anything like that. They've got hold of the materials. They've warped it. They've twisted it. They've added another um, special weekend on for for Christian fundamentalism. And now, no, no, it's no laughing matter. And now they're in Syria and they're beheading Muslims. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? It's pretty relentless. And every week we're hearing of another two or three hundred Christians from some crazy place in the world or another that have gone out to Syria simply to behead Muslims, publicly, beheading them. Oh, and stabbing policemen in Paris if they can get hold of them at the same time to publicize the cause of Christianity and the kingdom of God. Can you imagine how embarrassing you'd be? What would that impact be on your ministry? Can you imagine it? How many such headlines would there have to be to have a real negative impact on how you feel about the confidence that you have to explain that you're a Christian at work? My dear friends, this is what the Muslim community is having to cope with every single day. You might think, oh, it's just another ISIS thing. No, it's not. I just say this is a huge challenge for moderate Islam. And I tell you this, this is one of the reasons why I believe we are seeing so many Islamic people from an Islamic background, walking into the doors of Christian mission churches, alpha groups, our homes, asking questions about faith because they are raising fundamental questions about their own. So, okay. Now, meanwhile, Europe is dying. Reality check, it's the truth. You can check it out. Any nation that produces less than 2.4 children per couple is dying. You see, you either have to make babies, um, you either have to make babies or you have to import them. There's nothing else you can do. (laughs) That may sound a ridiculous statement, but it is absolutely true. Germany, in Germany today, the population is declining. Why is that? Because you need eight great-grandparents to produce a single great-grandchild in Germany. It's more or less the same in Italy, Portugal, um, uh, Greece. It's really important. Europe is dying Actually, across the UK, our birth rate in general, if it wasn't for migration, our birth rate in general has not kept pace with the population, um, uh, what we would need to sustain our population. So whole communities across the UK have also been dying, aging, getting old. 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.7. Scotland hugely affected by this. Without migration, the UK would be shrinking as a nation. The only reason we're growing as a nation is because of migration. Now, I'm not getting into sensitive debates about politics. I'm just saying reality. I'm just saying, pointing out the painful reality, which is that Europe is getting old, it's dying, 
and it's not the future. <laughs> People often said to me, you know, about Brexit or no, and I said, look, I'm not going to make a political thing, I just make an obvious statement. The future of the UK economy can't be in Europe because the future of the U European economy isn't in Europe, it's in emerging markets. 85% of humanity is in emerging markets. All the growth of its emerging markets. Actually, the future of the church is in emerging markets. Almost all mission movements that are driving the world today are coming from emerging markets. Yeah. Uh, almost all the growth in Bible colleges that are happening today in China, in India, in Latin America, in Africa, in the UK. No, why? Because so few people live here and we're all getting old. Our world is being transformed. There is a gigantic rise of Asia taking place, which is beyond the comprehension of most people on this earth. At the same time, where our own aging process is slowing down. So this woman here, on average, well, most of you, on average, are, have, have, lived, have, have had your life expectancy increased by an hour in the last four hours. And that's gone on for the last 20 years, and it will continue for the next 20 years, probably. So we're seeing aging increasing, increasing elderly populations, which affects our um, spectrum of life in the church. But at the same time, as I say, uh, babies, well, migration. <laughs> yeah, my friends, you have one billion people on the move, and Europe is dying. So you will see these, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you the truth, I'm telling you the future. These are forces that are even bigger than Donald Trump, God bless him. He thinks he can put a wall across Mexico. Do you know, what a crazy thing. All you've got to do is get a tourist visa and get a bus trip across for $100 and stay. Migration is changing the nature of church right across the face of this world. As migrants come into new communities, they acquire the faith systems of those new communities. Huge numbers of people from one religion are discovering another as they arrive. We're seeing large numbers of people turning to Christ in Germany right now. Church is overwhelmed as they have reached out to migrant communities because of Angela Merkel with a flick of the pen admitting 800,000 people. It's one of the greatest evangelistic opportunities and mission opportunities and kingdom and light and salt and, and, and social action opportunities that Europe has ever seen. Will we rise to it? <laughs> well, that's another question. In this country too, um, you know, I was talking to a church in Glasgow recently. I think they've seen something like 100 people from uh, Muslim backgrounds and others find faith who have largely arrived and relatively recently in the UK found faith. Uh, fantastic. Praise God for that. We've seen the same in our own church. Um, we're seeing uh, single language communities, uh, almost every church, almost every large church in London has more than one language community in it now, I would say. You know if you live in London or work in London, that more than half of all believers worshipping in London last Sunday were in black majority churches. And that doesn't count the uh, South Korean churches, the uh, Latin American churches, the Portuguese churches, the, um, the, uh, the Chinese churches, the, whatever it is. I'm just seeing our whole spiritual landscape in this entire nation is being transformed as movements of people bring faith with them. Our previous speaker, what a firecracker that was. Wasn't that a fantastic session? I thought, dear God, how can I follow him? <laughs> Do you know what? I was convicted. The phrase that really stuck out to me was, he said, I'm basically a second generation missionary to this country. Whole generations have come sent by churches from emerging markets into this country to retake this nation for Jesus Christ. It's just part of the future of mission. Let's turn off the TV and get with the picture. And these are monumental changes. Here's another one. Okay, we talk a lot about atheism and I hear the church sometimes uh, uh, discouraged, but this is the truth, reality check. Atheism is almost unknown in the human condition. It is almost impossible for a human being to be an atheist. <laughs> that is the truth, my friends. Look at the statistics for yourself. Around one in 50 of humanity doesn't believe there's anything there. All the rest do. I'll tell you this, if you were Coca-Cola and only one in 50 thought that Pepsi was all right, you would be very happy. <laughs> God's got a lot of people on his side. 
49 people believe they control the difference between Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Coca-Cola is better. 49 out of 50. And the other one says, Pepsi, okay. That's what we're saying about faith, about spirituality. So when people move, they bring spirituality with them. We're not importing atheists around the world or exporting atheists. It's very important. Atheism may have a powerful voice in this country, but I tell you, most people in this country believe. They may not believe what you believe, but spiritual awareness is almost universal. Do you know we are programmed for it? We have genes that program us to believe. Did you know that? Why? Because we're made in the image of God. We are programmed in the image of God. We have spirituality hardwired into our breath, into the structure of every cell in our entire body. The natural condition is to connect with what we're programmed to connect with. It's like a computer is connected to electricity. It's made for power. A human beings are made to go online spiritually. Amen? It's there, my friends. We need to have confidence in our message. Look at this English survey, huge survey, so spectacular. It was run by the EA and the Bible Society and a couple of other groups. I'm sorry I can't name them all. But you know what? It was, the results were so controversial, so spectacular. I was working with them on this. I said, we have to repeat this. No one will believe these figures. They can't be right. So we went out and did it again. We did a gigantic survey of unbelievers. We wanted to find out, have you ever had a witness from a Christian? Have you ever heard about Jesus? Has anybody ever talked to you about faith? Did they offer to pray for you? Did you feel it was a good experience? Or did you think, oh my goodness, what a load of... <laughs> At the end of it, did you feel more inclined to become a Christian or less? Oh, then we asked the Christians. We said, we've been talking to that lot, but we want to do a reality check. Or rather the other way around. You say, how often do you witness to your friends? How often have you prayed for someone in the last month? What's the reaction when you talk to your friends? What percentage would say do you think are more positive or less positive at the end? And then we went back and we had to look at the unbelievers again. And I thought, this is extraordinary. It was like um, 18 or 19 percent of the Christians said, I, I always offer to pray for people when I witness to them. I said, is there something I can pray for you? Just reality check here. We went and asked a whole load, thousands of unbelievers. When you do get pestered by a Christian about their faith, do they ever offer prayer by any chance? And you know what? I think it was 19.5% said yes. We put these together. We cross-checked. And we found some really exciting results. We found that 66% of Christians say they talk about Jesus every month. I've shown this to pastors, so not in my church. <laughs> You see, we are institutionally blind. We need to face the reality. A lot more of this is going on than we think. Usually, it's to do with a friend, a member of the family, a child, cousin, next door neighbor, someone at work. Um, here's an encouraging one. 31% of 18 to 34s say that they feel more positive, usually, after hearing about, uh, about faith. That's encouraging, isn't it? Listen, you wouldn't expect... Look, this is fantastic. If Marmite was getting this result, they'd be over the moon. <laughs> so you offer Marmite to people in a supermarket for free, huge tub of it, with a special discount if you'll try it for the first time. And when you do, you find that 31% of non-Marmite eaters say they'd be willing to give it a try. You'd be over the moon. You would be promoting and giving a million dollars to the head of marketing for such an ingenious campaign. <laughs> see... We don't realise it. Oh, this is very low. Only a third are positive. <laughs> I'll tell you something else. Reality check. You survey the next week, it's a different third. You see, when we probed, we found out why. He said, what made you positive? And you know, things like, um, things that led people to becoming Christians are things like, they had a weird experience. They, they went into a church in the middle of the countryside that had been there for 1,000 years. <laughs> They'd never been in a church. They walked in there and they were spooked out like the ghosts of all these worshippers for 1,000 years. And then someone talks to them about faith. Really open. That week, following week, 
Nah, life's too short. We're seeing windows of opportunity. The truth about mission, as far as I can see, I've analyzed the data is that thick. The truth about mission is that people open and they close and the periods are short. A friend dies, someone's been diagnosed with cancer, they're sick, they've lost a job, um, their relationship's broken up, they're having difficulties at school. Things happen to their lives, they open, they close, they open, they close, and we need to be ready there with the gospel alongside them in the basis of friendship, we walk with them. 20% of adults want to hear more, that's one in five, I think that's pretty high, I tell you, this is off the scale from any marketing point of view. 27% will say they were asked if they wanted to pray. Um, by the way, Scottish I spoke at the National Prayer Breakfast, had a look at the Scottish survey data. Completely independent survey, set up in a different way. Very interesting results. 30% say Scotland is a Scottish country, uh, is a Christian country. <laughs> you better cut that out. <laughs> Shh. Shh. I'm going to get through this. 34% of 80 to 24-year-olds say the Bible is the actual inspired word of God. Now, look, I don't mind if we're out by 10 points. It might be that we've overstated it by 10. I'm happy with 20. In fact, I'm happy with, 28, with, with 18. 60% have a favorable view of Christianity. By the way, it was the same um, in, in England. Most people like you. Did you know that? They like your faith. They think you're cool. They don't think you're bigoted, despite all the shenanigans and the speeding up we do over gender and transgender and this and the other gender, and all the other things that we think we're criticized over because we have misunderstood the loving message which we think we bring, which is sometimes regarded in a different way or distorted in a different ways. Do you know what? People like us. On the whole, most people in the UK think that Christians are cool to have around. They don't think you're bigoted. They think you're sincere. Wish they had your faith. They admire you, they respect you. They watch the social action, they, they've read all the stuff. They, they, they see street pastors, they see the food banks. They know that the church has been good news, good people to have around. They've all got stories of friends, of friends have been helped in some way by someone who was a Christian who was in a church or something like that. I say, thank God for this. this see, we beat ourselves up, we say, we're a post-Christian country, or we're a secular society, or we're dominated by atheism. I say, what kind of planet are you on? Where do you live? That's not what I'm seeing. At 33% of 18 to 24 year olds are interested in hearing what the Bible says in Scotland about illness, death, family conflict, money, finances, 70% about dating. Go and look at the survey results for yourself. I think it'd be worth publishing it in detail in the Elim magazine, actually. Um, okay, it's this kind of stuff has created. Jesus said, let your light shine. My friends, the light has shone. Uh, people who claim they don't believe, now let's have a look at atheism again. People who claim they don't believe or cannot know often have very strong beliefs in my view and experience about things like uh, they wear copper bracelets. I don't know any scientific evidence whatsoever that can show any, any benefit from a copper bracelet. But they believe in them. They have a belief that's as strong as my belief in Jesus Christ about copper. God bless them. <laughs> See, I've never met an atheist who wasn't full of faith. It's true. I don't think I've ever met an atheist that didn't have faith in all kinds of crap. <laughs> I'm really getting into trouble here. <laughs> you dissect, put me up with any atheist, I'll dissect their belief system and find all kinds of things. Okay, alternative medicine, ghosts, strange powers, goodness knows what. And underneath it all is the big question about where life's going. You know, I often think about the story of Philip and the Ethiopian, and I pray for these amazing synchronous moments, don't you? You know, when we collide with someone who's hungry and thirsty, at the very moment they are opening the gospel, at the very moment after they learned that their mother was sick, at the very moment after that relationship broke up, you were just there at the right time. You never take the call on holiday, uh, but you recognize, you thought, I just take it once. And it's this person, they're just breaking their heart open, they're open right now, the following week you're with them, and two weeks later they become Christians because you picked up the phone, you followed the command from Philip had from the angel of the Lord, he said to him, go! I don't know, he said, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know how long I'm going to be there. The angel of the Lord said, go, I believe, that's what I'm praying for, I'm praying for hundreds of thousands of Philip and Ethiopian moments, which will transform our evangelism and make sure we're in the right place at the right time in this synchronous process locked into the eternity of history. 
I was in um, uh, one of the largest IT companies in the world in Canary Wharf just the other day with my business partner. I've learned that by operating with a business partner who's a Christian, we gossip together. When people ask us what we do or why we do it, we look at each other and we just gossip. And we gossip faith and Christianity and let the others listen in. And it's amazing what happens. So <laughs> these guys, they said, how long have you been in business? I said, well, a couple of years. Where did you meet? Long story. Uh, so what are you doing it for? That's a very personal question. No, we'd really like to know. Well, shall we close the business first? So half an hour later, I said, you really want to know? Yes, 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 yes. So we're in this bar. So I said, well, it's a bit of a long story. It's, it's quite personal, but Ravi and I met in a, at a Christian mission event. It was for Christian business people and actually for their friends who weren't in faith. And Ravi came along. He was a, Ravi can tell you his own story. Jesus appeared to him in a dream 22 years ago. His life's been complete. And he was just gossiping faith. And um, I thought... They're still listening. So they keep asking more questions. More. And, you know, this is the reason we're doing it. This is why we're in business. We want to chunk out a huge amount of money into emerging markets to change the world and do, do something fantastic to make a difference. And they're really hanging on this, hanging on this, hanging on this. The questions kept coming thick and fast. And we just, and, uh, you know, Ravi and I were sort of talking to each other. Yeah, and then you have this prophetic word. I'll just, I'll explain what a prophetic word is in a moment. But we just... <laughs> We were just gossiping, you know, how was it? No, 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 it didn't happen. No, no, you did that first. No, no. We were just describing the journey we'd been through, and they're listening, and they're listening, and they're listening. At the end, there was four of them. There was one of them that had been really asking the most of the questions. At the end, we were hovering around Canary Wharf tube station trying to go home with minutes till the station closes. The place is deserted, and Rub is doing like a, a strange sun dance behind me. I, I, can't, I can't interpret what he's doing. And I, I'm just trying to say goodbye. Yes, it's been very nice. To, and then they're starting again. Got to go. Yes, yes. yes back again. And Ravi's going. <laughs> anyway, eventually I realized that there was, he was signaling. He said, wait. She, she needs to become a Christian now. I said, what? <laughs> anyway, this, uh, one of them hung back. Really hung back. And she said, I've been listening to what you say. I've been raised up in a Hindu background. My mother is Indian. I was a Christian, but she know, you know, I went to a Christian school, but my dad was Hindu. And, but I've never done business with Jesus, and I need to. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> we found some cafe that was open. We pumped as much scripture into it as, as we possibly could in 40, 40 minutes. <laughs> And, uh, and then we pray for her. I'm just saying, that was a Philip and Ethiopian moment. You know, I could so easily have missed it. Ravi saw it. I missed it completely. I wasn't listening. I wasn't listening to the Holy Spirit. Ravi saw it. And I believe those are the kind of moments we should be praying for over and over and over and over again. And you know what hooked her in? It was when we talking about the asset story and the revolve that we have in AIDS around the world in these different countries and educating people about sexual health. See, people love our God. Don't love our God, but they love our values. They get in, pulled in by the values. And, um, and there we were in, this, in the railway station. And, you know, it's just extraordinary. We live in the era of the precious child. 18 to 13-year-olds, this is still youth these days because I define adulthood now really as settling down, knowing who you're longer-term relationships are, being in your big career, and probably owning a property. And that takes about until the age of 48 these days. <laughs> so 18 to 30-year-old, this is kind of sort of youth apprenticeship. This is the curiosity experimenting and boomeranging back home to mum and dad. Now, this is a really important group. These are first lifers. This is a really important group. They're really open to the gospel right now. Believe me, I will prove this to you. First lifers, 30 to 65-year-olds, a nightmare to get into the church because they're never there. They belong, but they're never there. Why is that? Because they're so busy. They're hyper busy. Two careers, occasional as the new regular. But watch this. The vulnerable area is the kids. They're really, really wanting their kids to have a good basis and foundation for their lives. And they may not love our God, but they love our values, and they want our values for their own children. That is why... Atheists and Hindus and Muslims and agnostics and all the rest of it are thundering to the door, knocking the doors down at every single Anglican church in the country. Did you know that? These Anglican schools, these church schools, these church academies are massively oversubscribed, not just because of excellence, but because of values, my friends. One million children attend Church of England schools, 4,500 primary and medical schools, at 220 secondary schools, and we're just building another 120 at the moment. Isn't that amazing? Do you know the big shortage is people are coming to the door of the church, educate my children, please, but we're short of Christian teachers. It's a huge, huge mission opportunity. 
And, um, and uh, you know, this is just one fellowship group. In hundreds of these schools, we should be seeing, or we are seeing in some uh, Christian groups, faith groups, peer-led mission groups, goodness knows what other kind of groups, and seeing these, these, these schools infiltrated, or rather infused, by pupils, not by teachers, but by pupils. When I was a student, I was 15, Sheila and I, is my wife and my best friend for the last 40 years, we were missionaries in two different schools at the age of 15. We ran peer-led Christian unions in schools. Scripture union, Youth for Christ, Elim, all these movements. We need to take this mandate seriously and at the very least make sure that in church schools there are decent peer-led groups that are being properly supported. I feel passionately about this. This is a massive sign of openness to the kingdom of God right now in our society, in our secular, atheistic, humanist society where Christianity apparently is hated. You have all these parents stampeding to entrust their children to us, their most precious asset being entrusted to the church. What does that tell you? It tells you what you read in the press is not real, my friends. Get with the picture. Now, second lifers. This is another group. This is the group that expected to be dead at 70. And they're still going. <laughs> they're doing street, street evangelism at the age of 103. <laughs> and by the way, they're very young in heart. Uh, why? Because any, I tell you this, any 70-year-old today in your church was, it was 20 years old in the hip days of 1967. <laughs> so we need to recalibrate how we think about every generation and how we reach them. And here is a, a second lifer. A second lifer phoned me up from the House of Lords, shall remain anonymous. He phones me up, says, Patrick, I'm on a spiritual journey. I've had a bit of a Christian faith at one time. I don't have now. I'm searching, Patrick. I want to bring some people together. I want you to help me to find faith. I'm bringing together a rabbi and a Hindu and a Hindu uh, um, priest and a Buddhist priest and a couple of Catholic priests and a, and, a, and a few others. And I want you to come along and talk to me. Okay. So then he phones up and says, actually, I have some more friends that are going to come as well. By the time we got there, he said, actually, I've got 60 friends who are chairman, CEOs of some of the largest institutions of the world. They're MPs, they're lords, they're journalists, they're artists, they're TV producers. They're all stampeding to come to my session on how to find faith and sort your life out. Are you able to come still? He said, by the way, he said, I'm giving you the last word on one condition. You've got to behave. You're not allowed to give an altar call, okay? This is over dinner. <laughs> My friends, you might think we live in an atheistic, secular, cynical, humanistic world, but I'm seeing something very different. I'm seeing that our world is open, hungry for values, desperate for meaning, looking for reference points, and I love you to bits, and I'm hoping you can provide some common sense way to navigate through the spiritual chaos. So there we were at the club, but this is the room we spoke in, and I said to this guy afterwards, I said, you know what? You think you're not a believer, but you're a faith follower. You think you're not a Christian, but you're a follower of Jesus. Am I, he said. I think you teach the stories of Jesus to your children. I do, he said. I read them Bible stories. I think that Jesus is the greatest teacher that ever lived. He said, I think you believe in God. I do, he said. Well, with my right brain I do. My left brain thinks I'm a nonsense. <laughs> I have his arguments with myself all day long. He wrote this 40-page paper. 20 pages was left brain stuff. Analytical reasons why, you know, you can't prove God and all this. And, 40, and another 20 pages is right brain stuff. This, oh, I just encountered experience. I couldn't explain it. I just felt the presence of God. So inside many, many people, I would say, who are on the edge of faith, and this is the future of mission. It's a battle in the hearts and minds of every single, actually it's in the brain of every single person you talk to between their left brain and their right brain. The left brain is the analytical, uh, analytical sequential, rational logic. I want to prove it. This is Thomas. The right brain is intuitive. I just know. I just know. I just know that God is there. And helping, uh, helping people to look up and look around. The scripture says, all that may be known of men about God lies before the things he has made. Helping people to look up, look around, examine the world, to see the things they know deep down are true, that make sense, that resonate. The fact that the teachings of Jesus 
are, in most people's minds, the most widely respected teachings that have ever lived, the most logical explanation for the whole future of the universe, for everything that is, these self-authenticating profound truths, love your enemies, you must be born again. You know, it's impossible to teach leadership at a business school without teaching the teachings of Jesus. They're the only teachings that work. Treat your customer like you'd like to be treated yourself. I've already talked about mentoring and making disciples, and I'm out now. But you know what? I think about the power of the resurrection story, that our stories as we encounter that same power in our lives, and the central truth that to all who believe, we provide a channel to become the children of God. Isn't that an amazing thing? I just want to encourage you, therefore, in closing, and say, look, the future can be a mighty confusing place, but take heart. Take heart, my friends. And let's use the kingdom influence we have every day to make disciples and to change the entire world and not listen to the voices of nonsense, uh, of whether, whether it's about uh, the fact that you, know, you can't teach anymore in a church because no one will listen or worship's an outdated modality or home groups are defunct or Alpha's a bit like past century. Uh, let's focus on what really matters. Have confidence in the power of the gospel story of the people around you whose lives have been changed. And let's tell it, let's tell it with a joy in our hearts and with a humility saying we haven't got it all right. We don't understand all the mysteries of suffering or eternity. But all we know is this, that there is a God in heaven who made this. That Jesus is the greatest teacher about him that has ever lived. That miracles are an everyday occurrence for us when we mesh ourselves into the cogs of eternity and become as synchronized as Philip and the Ethiopian was. And we live in the world of constant, blessed, anointed coincidence, going from place to place, from challenge to challenge, opportunity for opportunity. And we say, Lord, breathe on every single thing that we do, on every email, every phone call, every meeting, every smile, every human contact and expression of life to see your kingdom come, your glory shine, your name be known in the whole earth. Hallelujah.